Bishop Callistos has written widely on the history and the faith of the Orthodox Church and is particularly interested in the mystical theology of the Christian East. His books and his many articles have had a profound influence on so many people. We all eagerly look forward to his lecture tonight entitled Orthodoxy and the Eastern Catholics, Problem or Opportunity? Please join me in warmly welcoming His Grace, Bishop Callistos. Brother bishops, fathers, <coughs> brothers and sisters, friends, glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory. Father John was kind enough to mention my books. So let me begin this evening with a story about what happens to people who write books. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a distinguished author. And after death, he woke up to find himself, much to his surprise, in a cauldron of boiling water. And at frequent intervals, demons approached with burning logs, which they pushed under his cauldron, making the water hotter and hotter, until it became most disagreeable. <laughs> After a time, he looked out, and he saw in a cauldron next to him a man who was reclining at his ease in water that was pleasantly warm. And no demons came and put burning logs under his neighbor's cauldron. So he asked the man next door, Why are you here? What did you do? And the man next door said, I murdered my wife. The author became extremely indignant, called over the chief demon. Is there no justice in this place, he said. Here am I, a distinguished author, and you keep putting burning logs underneath my cauldron, and I am really getting very uncomfortable. Whereas next door, here is a man who has done something horrible, and you don't do anything to make his water hot. Yes, said the chief demon, it's true, he murdered his wife, but he did it in a fit of anger. He's long since repented. She's forgiven him. All is well. But you, you wrote books, and people are still buying your books and reading them. And every time somebody buys one of your books, we put another burning log under your cauldron. <laughs> Before I come to my main theme tonight, I would like to ask a very general question. And I will give my answer, but I would like you to ask the the same question of yourselves as I shall now ask of myself. Why do I care about Christian unity? My first thought is I don't care nearly enough. But then my second thought is I care about Christian unity because I believe in God, the Holy Trinity. Inspiration for me in work for Christian unity is summed up in the words we use in the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. Let us love one another that with one mind we may confess Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Trinity, one in essence and undivided. What is the connection between mutual love and faith in the Trinity? 
God is love, says St. John in his first epistle. But self-love, the love of one, turned inwards, isolated, is not the fullness of love. Love signifies the presence of another, of a thou as well as an I. Love signifies gift, exchange, communion. Now, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is exactly a way of affirming that all of this is true, not just of human beings, but of God. The Christian God, says Karl Barth, is not a lonely God. God is not just the monad, one, alone, loving himself. God is the triad, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, loving one another in an unceasing movement of perichoresis from all eternity. From all eternity, the first person of the Trinity says to the second, you are my beloved son. From all eternity, the second person replies to the first, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. From all eternity, the third person seals this interchange, this dialogue. So, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is a way of saying that God is not just self-love, but mutual love. God is not just personal, but interpersonal. Not just a unit, but a union. As one of the greatest living Greek Orthodox theologians, Metropolitan John Zizioulas of Pergamum has said, the being of God is relational being. Without the concept of communion, he continues, it is scarcely possible to speak about God at all. Now, we are made in the image of God. And that means, yes, in the image of Christ, the Logos, but it means also we are living icons of God, the Trinity. As Charles Wesley says in one of his hymns, you whom he ordained to be transcripts of the Trinity. So if we are icons of the Trinity, all that I have just been saying about God applies also to us. God is love, says St. John. And that great 18th century English prophet, William Blake, extends the truth by affirming man is love. God is not self-love, but mutual love. So also is the human person in the divine image. God as Trinity is a threefold I and thou to use Martin Buber's terminology. And we humans also fulfill our humanness precisely through relationships of I and thou. God as Trinity is gift, exchange, self-giving. So also are we human beings. The being of God is relational being so also is our human being. So, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity means this to you and to me personally. As
as human persons. We are what we are only in relation to other persons. There is no true person unless there are at least two persons, or better still, three, in communication with one another. I need you in order to be myself. That is what the doctrine of the Trinity signifies. Father Pavel Florensky, the scientist theologian who died in Stalin's prison camp, affirms between the Trinity and hell there lies no other choice. That is to say, either we love one another after the image of God the Trinity, or in the end, there is a loss of all joy and all meaning. L'enfer, c'est les autres, says Sartre. Hell is other people, and it often feels like that. <laughs> but surely T.S. Eliot comes far closer to the truth when he says, What is hell? Hell is oneself. Hell is alone. The other figures, merely projections. There's a story told of Saint Macarius of Egypt in the Gerontikon, in the sayings of the Desert Fathers. Once he was walking through the desert, and by the roadside he saw a skull. He tapped it with his stick, and he said, who are you? And the skull replied, I used to be a pagan priest. Where are you now? asked Macarius. I am in hell, said the skull. What's it like there? said Macarius. And the skull replied, this is the nature of our torment. We are bound, each, two by two, back to back, and we cannot see each other's faces. There is the essence of hell. Not to be able to relate, not to be able to love, not to be able to see the face of the other. The Greek word for person, prosopon, means precisely face, countenance. I am only a person after the image of God the Trinity. If I face other persons, if I look into their eyes and let them look into my eyes. At the beginning of the modern era, the early 17th century, Descartes, took as the starting point of his philosophy, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And perhaps his rather narrow view of the human being as a thinking being is responsible for many of the problems in the modern world today. How much better it is to say, not cogito ergo sum, but amo ergo sum. I love, therefore I am. And even more, amor ergo sum. I am loved, therefore I am. In the words of the great Romanian theologian Dimitri Stanilawe, in so far as I am not loved, I am unintelligible to myself. Now, because I believe all this about God as Trinity, because I believe all this about human persons 
in the image of the Trinity. I am bound to be concerned about reconciliation, about the overcoming of division, within humankind, yes, but more particularly among Christians. Because I am a living icon of the Trinity, that is why I should be concerned about the restoration of Eucharistic communion among all Christians. Insofar as I am not loved, says Dimitri Stanilawi, I am unintelligible to myself. And we can apply that to our work for Christian unity. Insofar as I am not loved by my fellow Christians, insofar as I do not love them in return, I am unintelligible to myself. My own church membership becomes meaningless. So here, then, is for me the ecumenical imperative seen in the context of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Let us love one another that with one mind we may confess Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. I need you in order to be myself. We affirm that each as specific human persons, but we affirm that also as members of church communities. We need each other in order to be ourselves. And this is true most particularly of Orthodox and Eastern Catholics. We each need the other in order to be ourselves. So I turn now to my basic question this evening. Problem or opportunity? The normal orthodox view of Eastern Catholics has been until very recently and in many places still is a negative view, as we know all too well. Eastern Catholics are often seen by the Orthodox as a major obstacle to unity discussions. Many times in the past, the Orthodox have said, if we are going to talk with Catholics, we would rather talk with Latin Catholics. And we are all aware of the fact that as a result of the revival of the Eastern Catholic Churches in Ukraine, in Slovakia, in Romania, following the fall of communism, great difficulties have arisen in the Catholic Orthodox dialogue. Tonight, however, I wish to suggest an alternative approach. I would like to suggest that we Orthodox should see the Eastern Catholics as our best friends in the Catholic Church. We should see the existence of the Eastern Catholics not primarily as an obstacle, but as an opportunity. Here I recall what was said by the ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras in the 1960s to the Melkite Catholic patriarch Maximus IV. You spoke for orthodoxy at Vatican II, he said. You were the voice of our common hope. I can remember the excitement that I felt that time, an Orthodox layman, 
as I read accounts of Vatican II, and as I read in particular the speeches made by the Eastern Catholics. And again and again in Vatican II, especially on issues concerning the nature of the Church, I felt that the Eastern Catholic spokesmen in the Council were making exactly the points which, as an Orthodox, I wanted to see made. I felt like, as Patriarch Athenagoras felt, here is the voice of our common hope. If we adopt this second approach towards the Eastern Catholics, then we ought to say strong and dynamic Eastern Catholic churches are not a threat to us Orthodox. On the contrary, they are something which we can and should welcome. We should be delighted that the Eastern Catholics are recovering a new and deeper understanding of their liturgical and canonical tradition and indeed a new and deeper understanding of their theological and spiritual inheritance. The theme of last year's lecture by my friend, Father Robert Taft, speaks very much to my heart that the Eastern Catholics are indeed recovering their own distinctive theology, are speaking in their own particular voice. And this is something which we Orthodox can and should support. At the risk of recalling unhappy events in the past, we might ask, why do the Orthodox customarily object to the existence of the Eastern Catholics? Speaking very frankly, I see three possible reasons for orthodox reservations. There is first the charge of deceit. Orthodox often feel if Catholics use the Byzantine liturgy, this constitutes some kind of trick. They are pretending to be orthodox when in fact they are not they are constituting a kind of fifth column, a Trojan horse. <laughs> then, the second charge I often hear mentioned by Orthodox concerns the use of force. The different unions, or at any rate some of them, established between the Eastern Catholics and Rome, so it is argued. Unions in Ukraine in 1595-6, and then later in Romania and Slovakia, these, it is said, were brought about in large part by state pressure. And then there is the third charge of division. The different unions, it is said, did not result in the reconciliation to Rome of the total body of Eastern Christians in each area. But they merely split the local church, replacing one schism with another. Though part of the group were united with Rome, the other part were not, and this local schism was far more damaging and painful than what had existed before. I imagine that when um, the Balamand Declaration in 1993 said that today unionism is not to be endorsed as a policy for reunion, 
It was this point that they had in mind. We do not further the cause of reunion if we in fact create another schism. However, there are answers to these three charges, answers which will come very readily to the mind of Eastern Catholics in this audience, but perhaps you'd like to hear them from an Orthodox. <laughs> First and most fundamentally, the Eastern Catholics exist today. They cannot simply be told to disappear. <laughs> it is unhelpful to say, we shall treat you as an optical illusion. <laughs> that is why I want to stress that the existence of the Eastern Catholics is to be seen as an opportunity. Then I would like to comment on the three points that I made, deceit, force, and division. First, surely our guiding principle in all religious matters has to be freedom of conscience. In an early Christian text, late first or early second century, the epistle to Diognetus, it is said, and this is one of my favorite all-purpose quotations, God persuades, he does not compel, for violence is foreign to him. That is a golden saying, and I wish that Christians through the centuries had thought more about it. God persuades, he does not compel. Human persons are free, and they make their moral decisions in their own conscience freely before God. As Nicholas Berdyaev says, God is truly present and operative only in freedom. Freedom alone should be recognized as possessing a sacred quality, while all the other things to which a sacred character has been assigned by humans since history began ought to be made now and void. Freedom of conscience, then, is something we must always hold fast to. Therefore, as an orthodox, I fully accept that if Eastern Christians, exercising this freedom of conscience, choose to enter into communion with Rome, while still retaining their Eastern liturgy and church customs, then we Orthodox are bound to respect their decision. It is not a question of deceit, it is a question of freedom of conscience. Then, secondly, what about the charge of force? Well, our Lord Jesus Christ mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount the question of having a beam in your own eye and then trying to remove a moat from your neighbor's eye. We Orthodox have also used force when we've been in a position to do so. When groups of Eastern Catholics were united with orthodoxy in the Russian realms, but mainly in what had been Poland in 1796, in 1839, in 1875, are we to say that there was no pressure from the Tsarist government? Still more, when after the Second World War, the Eastern Catholic churches in Ukraine, Romania, and 
Czechoslovakia were driven underground. Was there not immense pressure from the communist government? All right, it was the communists, not the orthodox, who abolished the Eastern churches. But the orthodox benefited from this. Surely it is never right for any Christian community to acquiesce in the persecution of other Christians by the civil authorities. Let's dwell a little more on this question of freedom from state control the interference of the state in church affairs, which I've just been mentioning. I find it very interesting that relations between Orthodox and Eastern Catholics, both in the past and today, are on the whole better in Syria and Lebanon, in the Melkite world, than they are in Ukraine, Romania, or Slovakia. Why should this be? One possible reason, not necessarily the only reason, is perhaps this. In 1724, when the church of Antioch split into two groups, one in communion with Rome, the other group in communion with Constantinople. The Ottoman authorities were on the whole indifferent. They may have intervened to a limited extent, but for the most part, they regarded it as none of their business. And perhaps relations continued to be far better in the Arab world than in the Slav world precisely because the state was not directly involved. Once you bring in the police and the army, bitterness is greatly increased. And coming to the third point, the point of division, if the different unions led to further schisms, this was certainly not the original intention of those who initiated these unions. I am by no means an expert on the story of the union of Brest-Litovsk in 1596. But surely it is very greatly oversimplifying the situation to say that the hierarchy of the Church of Kiev, in its great majority, decided to break communion with Constantinople and to enter into communion with Rome. I wonder whether they really wished to break communion with Constantinople? Is it not possible that in their own minds they hoped that they could indeed be united with Rome and could enjoy the protection of Rome against the Polish nobility, against the Latins, but still more against the Protestants, that they could do all this without severing their traditional connection with Constantinople. In the event that did not happen, because the hierarchy of the Church of Kiev was not unanimous, and some bishops did not enter into the union with Rome, and therefore two parties were formed, one united with Rome, one with Constantinople. But it may well be that in the back of the minds of those who entered into negotiations with Rome was the hope that they could have remained in communion with 
both sides. Thinking of how the existence of Eastern Catholics might present to us an opportunity rather than an obstacle. I would now like to recall the initiative taken in 1995 by Elias Zogby, formerly Greek Catholic Archbishop of Baalbek in the Lebanon. On the 18th of February, 1995, Archbishop Elias, as a Greek Catholic, signed the following declaration. One, I believe everything which Eastern Orthodoxy teaches. Two, I am in communion with the Bishop of Rome in the limits recognized to the first among the bishops by the Holy Fathers of the East during the first millennium before the separation. Two days later, 20th of February, the Greek Orthodox Metropolitan of Vyblos, Georges Khodra, wrote, signed a statement affirming I consider this profession of faith by Kier Elias Zogby to fulfill the necessary and sufficient conditions to reestablish the unity of the Orthodox churches with Rome. Metropolitan Elias' profession of faith was soon afterwards endorsed by all the members of the Greek Catholic Holy Synod, the Melkite Synod, with the exception of two. That is by a total of 24 bishops. I understand that of the two who did not sign, one was in Canada and one in the USA. Now, what is Metropolitan Elias proposing in this statement? In effect, he is suggesting to the Antiochian Orthodox Church that the Melkite Catholics and the Antiochian Orthodox could enter into communion with one another without breaking communion, respectively, the Melkites with Rome and the Orthodox with Constantinople. So he is evidently proposing a situation of double communion. I can't imagine Latin Catholic bishops proposing that, but I find it very interesting that this proposal comes from Eastern Catholics. Now, a widespread reaction to the proposal of Archbishop Elias Zogby from both Roman Catholics and Orthodox has been this. It is impossible for a church to be in communion with two other churches when these two other churches are not in communion with one another. But there are, in fact, precedents for this kind of immediate communion. For example, the Meletian schism in the Patriarchate of Antioch in the 4th century. There were two rival bishops, you will recall, at Antioch at that time, Paulinus, who was a strict Nicene, and Miletios, who was suspected of compromising with the Arians, but who was also essentially a Nicene. Paulinus was in communion with Athanasius of Alexandria and with Rome. 
Miletios was in communion with St. Basil the Great at Caesarea in Cappadocia. Paulinus and Miletios were not in communion with one another, but Athanasius, Basil, and the Pope were certainly all in communion with one another. And the Church has, in fact, recognized both Paulinus and Miletios as saints. So there is a situation of mediate communion. Two churches out of communion with one another may yet be in communion with a third church. Or take the Bulgarian schism in the Orthodox Church in years 1870 to 72, communion was broken off by the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople with the Church of Bulgaria. And this schism between Constantinople and Bulgaria lasted until 1945, over 70 years. Yet throughout that period, the Church of Russia remained in communion with both sides. It might be said, in these instances, questions of faith were not involved. Meletius was not, in fact, an Arian. He was Nicene. The Bulgarians, though accused of the heresy of Philetism, were not, in fact, heretics. Philetism is to make the nation ethnic identity, the principle for the organization of the church, whereas on the true Catholic Orthodox understanding, the church is organized on a territorial basis. Well, if the Bulgarians were philatist heretics, what are we to say about all the Orthodox in the Western world? whose churches are organized on an ethnic rather than a territorial basis. However, assuming there was no serious doctrinal difficulty in those two cases of mediate communion, can we say the same of orthodoxy and Rome? As an Orthodox, I am bound to say that the question of universal primacy of the Pope and of papal infallibility does involve a question of faith, not just of canonical order. And for that reason, to my great sorrow, I feel the time has not yet come for the restoration of communion between our churches. As an Orthodox, however, those are the only issues which seem to me today to be of basic significance. Yes, there is the question of the filioque. If it were to be omitted from the creed, if we were all to agree to recite the creed in the original form as affirmed by the early ecumenical councils, then I think once the filioque is left out of the creed, it could be entertained as a theologumenon, not as a dogma, with proper safeguards I do not see it as necessarily heretical. Over the filioque, I am a dove rather than a hawk, but there are probably some orthodox hawks sitting in different parts of my audience tonight. Also, I do not believe that our devotion to the Holy Mother of God is basically different. And therefore, I do not consider the question of the Immaculate Conception of the Holy Virgin to be an impedimentum dirimens, a ground for division. 
I believe the main point at issue here is not indeed the question of the Blessed Virgin, but rather it is a question of how we understand original sin. And with the other issues that have arisen between our two churches, I do not see any of them as ultimately a reason for continuing to be out of communion. To me, the basic problem remains the papacy. So let us get down to talking about that in our reunion discussion. But I'd now like to come back again and think a little bit more about the initiative taken, a characteristically Eastern Catholic initiative, by Archbishop Elias Zogby. And let's think of certain other instances of mediate or double communion. As I say, at the Union of Brest in 1596, very possibly, the Kievan bishops did not intend to break communion with Constantinople. And here I would like to recall the eloquent words of Bishop, now Archbishop, Sievolod of the Ukrainian Orthodox Catholic Church of America, when speaking to the Greek Catholic Synod of the Church of Kiev, at St. George's Cathedral in Lviv on the 26th of May, 1992. The Church of Kiev, says Kier Sevolod, took no part in the lamentable schism of 1054. Kiev always tried to maintain communion with both sides, following the excellent example of Patriarch Peter of Antioch. For several centuries, the Kievan hierarchy succeeded in keeping the schism from disturbing the life of the Kievan church. The church of Kiev tried in every way to maintain connections with old Rome and new Rome and to avoid taking sides in the deplorable estrangement between them. In fact, the schism was finally consummated far later than people usually assume. In the Eastern Mediterranean in the 17th century, there are repeated examples of communicatio in sacris. In the 1630s and 1640s, we can find many examples of Greek Orthodox bishops who invited Catholic clergy to come and act as confessors, to hear confessions in their dioceses. Yes, they would even invite Jesuits to do this. <laughs> well, the Holy Fathers of Mount Athos invited the Jesuits to establish a school at Carriers, the monastic capital, to teach the monks of the Holy Mountain theology. So doors were still open in the 17th century, which we often assume were closed. The situation was particularly striking in the Patriarchate of Antioch. There is a series of patriarchs of Antioch, such as Patriarch Eftimios Carmet, his immediate successor, also called Eftimios, and then Patriarch Makarios Zaim, who died in 1672. These patriarchs were certainly in communion, both with Constantinople and with Rome. So the separation, the schism, does not really become fully accomplished in Antioch at any rate until 1724. And even since then, there have been many examples of continuing intercommunion. 
what would the Orthodox require before Archbishop Elias's proposal could be accepted? I would mention two things, and they may seem hard sayings, but I have to be honest. First, for communion to be restored, the Catholic Melkites would need to cease to regard as ecumenical councils held unilaterally in the West after 1054. These could be seen perhaps as general councils held in the West, but it's difficult for us Orthodox to regard them as ecumenical when we were not represented at them. I recall in 1974, on the 700th anniversary of the Council of Lyon, Pope Paul VI was careful to refer to it not as an ecumenical council, but as a general council held in the West. Here, I think, is something that would help towards a restoration of communion. But then there is a second point, and this, I think, is the hardest one of all. The definitions of Vatican I, disputed by orthodoxy, would need to be looked at again. Catholics and Orthodox need to search together for a new formulation concerning the primacy and the teaching authority of the Bishop of Rome within the worldwide communion of the churches. Would the Melkites, and more particularly the Vatican, be willing to agree to this? A widespread suggestion is made that in understanding the papal claims, we should base ourselves upon the faith and practice of the church during the first millennium when the Latin West and the Greek East were in full communion. Well, that provides, again, a fruitful basis for discussion. But there are things that we need to look at. We cannot simply assert that as a unifying principle. We need to go further. First, there are different ways of reading church history. Do Catholics and Orthodox, in fact, agree in their assessment of the faith and practice during the first millennium. Was there indeed, during the first millennium, a single agreed view of the ministry of the Bishop of Rome in the worldwide church? In 451, Pope Leo the Great saw things one way, but the fathers of Chalcedon seem to have seen it in a rather different and then there is the second point. Can Catholics and Orthodox simply ignore all that has happened in the last thousand years? So in conclusion, I would say I see Archbishop Elias Ogbe's proposal as a prophetic initiative, imaginative and courageous, which has opened up the whole issue in a new way. And I see that as characteristic of the way in which the witness of Eastern Catholics can act not as an obstacle but as an opportunity. But much further discussion is needed before his proposal can become reality and communion can be fully reestablished. Before I end, I would like to issue a warning and tell a story. <laughs> First, my warning. Let us keep ever in mind our Savior's words that the world may believe. May they all be one, says Christ at the Last Supper. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
We are to reflect the mutual love of the Holy Trinity, not just for the sake of ourselves, but for the sake of the world. Our quest for social unity is fatally flawed if it is not linked with mission and social action. But mission leads me to think, how great could be the pastoral benefit if Orthodox and Eastern Catholics could work together? In how many cities here in um, North America and across the Atlantic in Europe are there side by side, often within a few hundred yards, parish churches of the Orthodox and of the Eastern Catholics, sometimes small parishes, poor parishes, struggling to survive. If we could unite, this would not only bring us happiness in overcoming division, but it would enormously strengthen our witness, our missionary outreach before the world. Where there are now two struggling parishes, there might be one strong, dynamic, expanding community, Orthodox and Catholic together. Would not our reconciliation help the world to believe. We should always keep that dimension in mind. Let us not be too parochial, domestic, in our thinking about Christian unity. That is my warning. And then my story. Once, Three friends of mine were walking through northern Greece in a deserted area of hill country. And as they went, they saw far ahead of them, coming towards them across the hill, a sheepdog. Now, this was bad news. Greek sheepdogs are extremely fierce. If you venture onto their territory uninvited, they will be unfriendly. And they are a great deal more aggressive than wolves. <coughs> a few moments later, my friend saw other sheepdogs approaching across the hills, all round them, from different directions. And the sheepdogs, with unerring aim, converged on my three friends and began walking round and round them in a diminishing circle. <laughs> now my friends knew that in such a situation the last thing you should do is jump up and down, wave your arms and shout. That will make it far worse. So they stood quite still. And the dogs circling round them came closer and closer. And they curled their upper lips and bared their yellow teeth. At this point, one of my friends, Philip Sherard, acting almost subconsciously, began talking to the dog. And instead of talking to them in aggressive tones, he spoke to them in an ingratiating manner. Ella skilakia mu, kala skilakia, ella palikaria mu. What beautiful dogs you are, wonderful dogs. <laughs> At this point, a very strange thing happened. The dogs began to look distinctly uneasy. They began eyeing one another in a hesitant manner. And suddenly, one of them broke out from the circle, crawled away on its belly for about 20 yards, then sprung up 
and ran at full speed back the way it had come. Finally, all the dogs did this, and my friends continued on their walk. What is the moral of this story? Surely the moral is this. Conciliation can be more effective than confrontation. Inner stillness, more dynamic than outward aggression. Humble love is more powerful than forceful violence. As Christ himself showed us by his life-creating death upon the cross and his third day resurrection. But it is not enough in our quest for Christian unity to induce the ecclesiastical sheepdogs to slink away. We need to do more than that. We want them to wag their tails, <laughs> especially if they are Orthodox sheepdogs and Eastern Catholic sheepdogs. <laughs> so this is my prayer and hope that here in this city of Pittsburgh and in all our home cities, there may be plenty of noetic tail wagging between the Eastern Catholics and the Orthodox. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Grace, for your enlightening, encouraging, and especially challenging words. If there are questions right now, His Grace would be able to entertain questions for a while. If you have a question, there's a microphone in each of the aisleways. Please approach the microphone to pose the question. Your Grace, I very much appreciated your talk. It really hit home in many ways. Rome has repeatedly promised the Orthodox churches that in a reunited church, all of your traditions would be respected. Um, however, here in North America, we Eastern Catholics have had a very difficult time defending our tradition of a married priesthood. In fact, this tradition has largely been taken away from us in many places. Does this situation cause you, as an Orthodox bishop, to question Rome's true intentions? Thank you. Your comment about the married clergy seems to me very much to the point. It has always been the Eastern Christian understanding that it is possible to combine a vocation to marriage with a vocation to the priesthood. This was part of the inheritance of the Eastern churches which entered into union with Rome and they were assured that it would be continued. Nobody perhaps at that time envisaged a situation where Eastern and Latin Catholics would be existing side by side in America. But it does seem to me that this is an important pastoral question which very directly affects the relationship of the priest to his people and therefore the life of the local church community. And certainly to me as an Orthodox, the progressive restoration to the Eastern Catholics of the right to have married priests in all parts of the world would be a very important indication that the Church of Rome does indeed respect and reverence the tradition of the Eastern Churches. 
Obviously, there are lots of other questions that have to be kept in mind. I would touch on one, to me, rather important issue, which is the way in which bishops are appointed. Um, I was reading uh, the book by Archbishop Quinn of San Francisco called, I think, The Reform of the Papacy. And I was very struck there when he emphasizes that the present-day practice whereby the Pope appoints the bishops in almost all parts of the world is relatively modern. And that at the beginning of the 19th century, the Pope only appointed a very small number of bishops. Now, I know that the Pope and those who advise him take very careful consultations before acting, but they are not obliged to follow the opinions of those whom they consult. And there's an enormous difference between appointing bishops in a collegial manner and making their appointment depend only upon one person. So again, for me as an Orthodox, when I look at the Catholic Church and think about reunion, I would ask, well, what does collegiality mean in practice? And so I feel the manner in which bishops are appointed affects very much the life of the total church and is another thing that I would be happy to talk about with my Eastern Catholic friends. Mind you, orthodox methods of appointing bishops do not always work ideally in practice. <laughs> People who live in glass houses may sometimes have to go and answer the door. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Your Grace. Thank you for the talk. It answered a lot of my questions that I had before. But I had one lingering question that just came to mind. Um, I believe in 1990, the International Theological Commission Dialogues was supposed to be on the topic conciliarity and authority. And that has been disrupted since. Now, I know Pope John Paul asked about a month ago, begging for the Orthodox Church to um, reinstitute them again, and I understand when Patriarch Bartholomew is here, he asked for them to begin again on the national level. What, besides the um, religious political issues in the Eastern Slav countries, is um, militating against that being resumed? Because that's, that's the target question that they were getting leading up to. Thank you. The Orthodox Catholic dialogue, as I see it, made a very helpful beginning in the 1980s. Wisely, they did not begin by taking up the traditional grounds of contention and disagreement between the two churches, because had they started there, it would merely have meant that each side would have repeated well-known arguments. They felt that it would be better to try and start from areas where there was agreement. And so they started, yes, by discussing the doctrine of the Trinity as a whole, rather than simply the procession of the Holy Spirit. And they started by discussing the relationship between the local and the universal church, seeing the church in Eucharistic terms, rather than directly addressing the question of the papacy. But I think the time has now come when the dialogue should be resumed and should consider directly the questions 
involving primacy and collegiality. Why is this not easily happening? It is due mainly to reservations on the Orthodox side. There are some Orthodox churches which are very firmly committed to pursuing uh, the dialogue, such as the Patriarchate of Constantinople or the Orthodox Church of Romania. There are other churches which are much more reserved in the Orthodox side, and I think uh, partly the reasons are due to insecurity existing in the former communist countries, fears and uncertainties of the future, which may not relate directly to the question of Orthodox Catholic uh, dialogue, but which do affect the general feeling of the Orthodox. So there is a need to build up mutual trust at present. There has been a breakdown of trust in many places, and this is what has to be restored. But I do hope that we can begin to tackle these basic questions of what is our vision of the structure of the Church of Christ on earth. Your Grace, I was very pleased with your vision of being able to share resources in communities. And I'm from a very small community in the Pittsburgh area where we're blessed to have four Eastern churches uh, within stone throwing distance of each other. And unfortunately, that has occurred in the past. <laughs> two of them Orthodox and, and two of them Catholic. Uh, at a local and practical level, what moves would you see happening to begin to move in those directions of moving from four independent uh, communities towards being one large witnessing church? I recall here the words of Cardinal Sunens of Belgium, where he, when he said, in order to unite, we must first love one another, and in order to love one another, we must first get to know one another. Therefore, it seems to me the first stage is for local congregations to meet together from time to time. Since we cannot, according to the Orthodox rules, have communion in the sacraments, what could perhaps be done would be to share in evening Vesper services or in an akafis to the Mother of God, and to have visits to one another's parishes, that one parish could invite another to come and be present at their service, and to take part in the singing. I think we have got to the point of friendship where this sort of exchange is possible and indeed very desirable that local congregations should not just be familiar with the appearance of the outside of the other person's church, they should actually go inside and see what it looks like there too. <laughs> I would also extend this by saying it's good to get people when they're young. It used to be said of the Jesuits, didn't they, that if the Jesuits got a child when he was six, they could do anything with him. Uh, well, now, I 
was thinking a time when people ought to be getting to know each other's churches is when they are theological students, where they become important and become archpriests or archimandrites or bishops. They don't have much time to make real friendships. But in our student years, we did have lots of time to make friendships. And this is the time when we ought to be forming ecumenical friendships. So I would hope that there could be not just between parishes, but also, and in particular, between seminaries, exchanges, that the students would visit each other's seminaries share in events and celebrations, and that there could be, as there is already in many places, an exchange of teachers. If people can form inter-church friendships in their student years before they are ordained, that may serve them very well in the future. Now, I think time is marching on. So perhaps we ought to draw to a close. We've had three questions in honor of the Trinity. So. <laughs>